Hello, this is the session on Java Persistence 2.1. I'm Linda DeMichel, and I'm the specification lead for this work. In this talk, I'm going to be giving you an overview of the new features in Java Persistence 2.1, or, or JPA, as it's frequently referred to. Java Persistence is the industry standard object relational mapping API for Java applications. JPA 2.1, uh, which is released as part of Java EE 7, is an update to the JPA 2.0 release, which was part of Java EE 6. The Java Persistence API delivers portability across both persistence providers and relational databases. Because it provides a high-level object view of your relational data and frees you from having to map between the tables and columns of relational databases, it increases developer productivity and thus provides uh, ease of development. And it's available for use not just in Java EE, but also in Java SE environments. So these are some of the new features that I'll be discussing in the course of this session. Uh, we've added many query language enhancements, support for type converters, an entity graph API for use in Finder and query operations, support for unsynchronized persistence contexts, which are useful in the modeling of conversations, support for standardized schema generation, and expanded metadata for queries and object relational mapping. In terms of the new query language features, we've added support for downcasting, which I'll be discussing in more detail shortly. Outer joins with on conditions. We added on condition support to outer joins, which you did not have in 2.0, and which is obviously a very useful feature for outer joins. We've added support for the standard invocation of both functions that are in the database themselves, as well as persistence provider specific functions that you can address in queries. We've added standardized support for the invocation of stored procedures. We've added support for bulk update and delete criteria queries. In JPA 2.0, uh, we had bulk update and delete queries within the Java Persistence query language, the SQL-like query language for JPA. We've tried very hard to align the functionality of the criteria API and um, the Java Persistence query language, and this was something that we brought in um, to make that alignment more rigorous. We've also added support for dynamically defined named queries. So you can define a named query at runtime and then register it by name with the persistence unit for uh, later use. We've also improved the result mapping support for native queries, in particular for constructor results and better, um, better configuration for embeddable results. Downcasting is a very useful feature because it gives you access to subclass specific attributes and queries, particularly where you have a relationship, a polymorphic relationship between two types. And the target of the in the target of the relationship, you want to access the subtype and subtype specific attributes. The treat operator serves both for the serves both for the purpose of filtering on the results as well as for downcasting. In the first example here, the relationship at the type level is between orders and products, where books are a subtype of product. And in our query, we want to filter out those products that are books, and we want to access the book-specific state. So the treat operator serves both purposes. It both filters and it downcasts, allowing us to access the book name and the ISBN, the, um, the code number for the book. In the second query, we're showing how the treat operator can be used to address partial entity hierarchies. So employee might have a number of subtypes, exempt employees, contractors, non-exempt employees, part-time employees, and so on. In this query, we're filtering out those employees that are either exempt or contractors, and in doing so, we're filtering on type-specific attributes of those, in the case of exempt, the salary attribute, and in the case of contractor, the hourly rate. We've also added support for stored procedures. Um, this is support for invoking database stored procedures that already exist in the database. It's not a stored procedure definition uh, capabilities. Stored procedures are notoriously database specific, both in their definition and in the way you access them and get back query results. 
JPA builds its stored procedure support uh, on top of that of JDBC, which, which provides an API for handling a full variety of query results, query results that are passed back through output parameters, through in-out parameters, through result sets, through some combination of, of all of these. Um, so it's very flexible in terms of what it can handle and how. Now, to use this facility, you need to define to the persistence provider how these stored procedures are going to be accessed. And you can do this either declaratively through the named stored procedure query um, metadata, or you can do it programmatically uh, through an API that we provide for runtime access. So in this example, we're defining a named stored procedure query with the name emprays. And we're defining its correspondence to a stored procedure in the database whose name is HRRaysProc. So this stored procedure has three is defined to have three parameters uh, in the database stored procedure. And the parameters are name parameters. Some database stored procedures only support um, positional parameters. So you need to know what type of parameters your, your database stored procedure is working with. In this case, we're assuming our database stored procedure supports name parameters. So we have three parameters. Two of these are input parameters of type integer and type string. The third is an output parameter, which the stored procedure is going to use to pass back its result. So here's how we would invoke the stored procedure. Using the Entity Manager, we create an executable stored procedure query instance uh, for our stored procedure query that we've registered as emprays. We set the values of its parameters. We execute the stored procedure. And then to retrieve the result, we access the result by getting the output parameter value. Type converters are a facility that we've added to convert between database and object attribute representations. So this conversion can be uh, both semantic as well as at the type level. And converters can be either what we call auto-apply, that is automatically applied, con automatically applied converters to all attributes of the target type, or they can be invoked on an attribute-specific basis. By default, auto-apply is false, and this example illustrates why. Um, so here's a converter that we've defined to convert between pounds and kilograms. We have to supply both of the conversion methods, the one that converts to the database representation and the one that converts back from the database representation to the Java object representation. So notice that this weight converter is typed over doubles. So unless we have an extremely trivial database, we wouldn't want this to be an auto-apply converter. Here's how we would apply that converter. Um, here we have a part, and it's got a shipping weight. So we specify at the attribute level that we want this converter invoked uh, to convert to our uh, pounds representation. This is an example of an auto-apply converter. Um, here we have a, a converter that converts between paint color, our object representation for paints, which are encoded as integers in, uh, in the database. This kind of encoding is often seen in legacy relational databases. The in integers are obviously not very friendly at the Java object point of view, so we want to define methods that convert into something that's uh, more intuitive for the application layer. This converter, because it is very, um, very type specific in terms of the semantics of paint colors, is appropriate for an auto apply converter. So notice that we don't need to specify uh, for our auto class that this converter needs to be invoked. It will automatically be invoked uh, in mapping from the database. Entity graphs, as the name suggests, are used to specify graphs of entities and attributes. And these attributes may, of course, include other entities themselves and so on down on the graph. They're used as fetch plans or fetch graphs for query and find operations. You take the entity graph and you can you <clears throat> you take the entity graph and you pass it as an argument to one of these operations to carefully control what data is retrieved. Um, Entity, the entity graph notion basically expands upon what we term default entity graphs that were defined by fetch type eager in terms of the metadata. Entity graphs can be defined in metadata through the named entity graph annotation or dynamically through the entity graph API. 
So in this example, we're defining an entity graph for the class employee. The entity graph annotation is applied to the entity class that's going to be the root of the entity graph. And we're specifying that when you pass this entity graph to a query or find operation, in addition to its primary key, which is always retrieved, we're going to be retrieving the, um, the named attribute node projects. Now note that projects by default is fetch type lazy. So even with a default entity graph, it would not normally be retrieved. And in the entity project, because the one-to-one -one with manager is fetch type lazy, we won't be retrieving it with this entity graph, or at least you should not expect that it would be retrieved, although the persistence provider might retrieve it. Uh, but we will be, of course, uh, we will of course be retrieving um, the project name, which is the primary key. Unsynchronized persistence contexts allow the application to control the binding of the persistence context to the JTA transaction and hence its behavior. Uh, when that transaction causes might cause the persistence context to be flushed to the database. They propagate with uh, in the case of container managed in the case of container managed persistence context, they propagate with the JTA transaction regardless of whether they are bound to that transaction or not. So these persistence contexts track persistent changes as your application modifies the persistence context, but they're not flushed to the database unless you join the persistence context to the transaction itself. They're particularly useful in modeling conversations. So here's an example. A shopping cart is perhaps a canonical example of uh, modeling of a conversation. The shopping cart is modeled as a stateful session bean which by default is transactional. So transactions, if a transaction is not in progress when one of the methods of the shopping cart is invoked, one will be started automatically for you by the container. Now we have two persistence contexts in this example. The first one is going to be used to model our shopping activities. And we've noted that it is an extended persistence context, so it lasts the duration of the, the shopping cart and it's also unsynchronized. So it will not be joined to or flushed with the transactions in progress unless you explicitly join it to those transactions. The second persistence context we've labeled as a tracking persistence context. This persistence context is synchronized with the, this persistence context by default is of course synchronized with the transactions in progress. And we're going to use it to track the activities of the customer. So as you might expect, we have a start to shop method, which is going to uh, take a customer ID and map it to a customer that we've retrieved from the database. And we're going to optimistically create a new order for this customer. And then we provide a number of methods that allow the customer to browse our shopping database. So in this case, our customer is going to be browsing for books. In these browsing methods, we're going to use the tracking persistence context to log the books that the customer examines. So we're going to accumulate the customer's interest. Perhaps we're going to suggest further titles to the customer. Or in a subsequent shopping session, we can use this information to uh, we can use this information to suggest other books to the customer, or we can email the customer and so on. You're all familiar with this sort of behavior. Um, so we have a similar find books by subject method. The customer can add a book to the cart. So notice that with our shopping persistence context, these activities will not yet be made persistent. Um, but finally, when we go to confirm the customer's order, and we attach this order that we've created to the customer instance, at this point it's appropriate to join the shopping persistence context to the JTA transaction in progress. And when that transaction commits, the contents of this order will be committed to the database. Schema generation is another important facility that we've added in this release. It's the creation of database artifacts, tables, foreign keys, integrity constraints, um, indexes, from entity metadata or from scripts. It's intended as an ease of development facility, particularly in prototyping, but it's also needed in some environments, particularly in cloud environments where you as the developer may not have direct control over the database that's provisioned for you, but yet you want it populated to correspond to your persistence, to your persistence unit. 
our schema generation facility is very flexible. It handles many different scenarios from a prototyping scenario all the way to production where you may want to generate your schemas on the basis of SQL scripts that you've carefully tuned for the application. It's controlled via properties that you pass in at deployment time or that are passed in at entity manager factory creation time. So these properties allow you to control what access to be taken on the database, whether you're going to create, drop, drop and create, which is particularly useful in prototyping or perhaps nothing, um, what you're going to use to create these database artifacts, whether it's going to be, whether they're going to be created on the basis of the object relational mapping metadata on scripts that you supply or some combination of the two and in which order, um, likewise for dropping. Um, where are scripts, if you're using scripts, are going to be found. Um, if you're generating scripts, which scripts you're going to be generating and where they're written. And also, we supply properties that allow you to uh, supply SQL load scripts for populating your database. Now, schema generation is based off of what we call the physical mapping metadata, uh, as well as on defaults. And several layers of defaulting may be involved. So for example, logical annotations generally entail uh, physical defaults. Uh, the table name, for example, is defaulted from the name of the entity. The entity name, in turn, of course, is defaulted from the class name. Uh, the physical annotations override or customize these defaults. Um, so to give you an example, a unidirectional one-to-many mapping defaults to a join table mapping. You can customize this mapping with a join table annotation, or you can override the fact that it's a join table mapping uh, with a join column mapping instead. In general, our existing metadata was quite complete for this purpose. Uh, we did need to add a couple of annotations to allow this process uh, to be more carefully controlled. First of all, index. Um, by default, primary keys do generate a database index, but you may want to index other, uh, other columns of your tables as well. Um, so the index annotation is used with the various table annotations to specify index columns. You can also use it with the primary key. If you've got a compound primary key, it's useful because you can use it to order uh, the index columns of that primary key, uh, which may be useful for performance reasons. The foreign key annotation is used to specify the handling of foreign key constraints. Um, the persistence provider will typically manage these foreign key constraints for you if you specify nothing here. Uh, but this is useful if you want to either inhibit the provider's use of foreign key constraints or if, if you want to customize the definition of those foreign key constraints. Again, tuning for your particular application. So I've given you a summary of some of the new features of this release. Uh, to sum up, uh, Java Persistence is the industry standard object relational mapping API for Java applications. We've added many query language enhancements, support for type converters, entity graphs, unsynchronized persistence context, schema generation. There's more. Um, you can access uh, our work at the JPA spec project on java.net for all of the details, including the expert group archives and discussions uh, and a host of download material. And for more information on Java EE7, I am going to leave you with a number of pointers as to how you can stay current and a pointer to our Glassfish reference implementation. Thank you.